Welcome to NNP Symposium. This is the uh, four o'clock Eastern time session. Uh, we're joined today by uh, Ken Brissett, uh, long time known within the numismatic hobby and industry, most familiarly as Mr. Red Book. And uh, we'll be talking about uh, Ken's career in numismatics and how he got started. And also joining us today is uh, Joel Oros, uh, retired professor of philanthropic studies at Grand Valley State in Michigan, uh, longtime numismatic uh, collector and author. All right, uh, Ken and Joel, if you want to unmute and start your video. We... There we go. Ah, oh, there we go. All right. All right, well, let's get started here. Um, uh, Ken Brissett was born in New Hampshire in 1928. Uh, many of us uh, grew up during the numismatic boom period of the, the 60s and 70s. Uh, as it turns out, there was another boom about a generation before that, beginning in the 1930s um, with the advent of the penny board and uh, millions of collectors uh, jumping into coin collecting. Um, so Ken, uh, tell us how you got started coin collecting. I think it goes back uh, in the early 30s. Um, and I'm not just sure exactly what prompted me. Um, I remember that, um, that those were depression days and parents had to kind of invent um, activities for their kids just to keep them busy. and. And one of, one of the things that I remember was um, we had a penny jar. I guess every household had a penny jar at home. And um, I would sort through those pennies and my mother would have me line them up by, uh, by the different dates that were on them. Um, we didn't know anything about the coins, but that was a way of learning about numbers and dates and things like that. So that was a very early activity. Uh, mother was inventive and she, she, she taught us to do some other little activities like that. And, and I think that uh, that kind of rubbed off on me. I had a kind of a uh, interest in, in looking at coins at least that far back. Then, then a little later on, probably around 1930, 34, um, a neighbor gave me a couple of coins to play with. One was a, was a little Chinese uh, copper square hold cash coin that everybody's familiar with. And, but I was just fascinated with that because it had a foreign looking language on it. And um, uh, in fact, she gave me two coins. The other one was a coin from Belgium that had a, it was a round coin with a round hole in the center of it. Um, these fascinated me and I kept them and, and, and still have them. And um, I think that was my first interest, um, but it grew later on. And, and the greatest impulse came in 1936, when uh, my favorite uh, radio program, A Little Orphan Annie, uh, had a promotional, a promotional <laughs> gimmick where uh, if you drank their, their product, Ovaltine, and uh, saved the labels, and you could send them in, and you would get um, uh, a foreign coin or a couple of foreign coins uh, through this promotion. And I... Uh, I followed the entire promotion, got all of the coins, and um, and I'm sure that's what started me on my collecting, in a, in a very serious way. Now, in your uh, your penny jar, were you finding Indian cents? Oh yes, uh, they were very common, and um, I would save those. Always save those when I could, uh, and sometimes they were good trading material for other coins, other. Kids would do, be doing the same thing, of course. Uh, now, there's a story about you uh, trading uh, as a child, trading comic books for for coins. Uh, is that correct? Well, well no, uh, that's not exactly correct. Um, although we, you know, as kids, we traded anything and everything, from bugs to uh, um, <laughs> to, to uh, uh, matchbook covers, things like that. Um, but I did have some comic books that were given to me uh, because you, you pass things around in those days, you know, and they, they went from person to person. And um, so, yes, sometimes I'd have a few uh, comic books that I could trade for coins or vice versa. 
yeah, and that was part of the process. But I think uh, somewhere you mentioned about um, uh, first first edition of the um, Superman book. I, I never had anything like that. Um, but that was something that we all dreamed about and watched for. We, we were aware of things like that back then. Now, at some point, you sort of became aware that there was more to this. There were a lot of collectors out there and companies and coin shops and literature. Uh, what was uh, sort of uh, your first uh, foray into a uh, sort of greater embrace of numismatics in that way? Well, we're talking about 1940s, uh, early, or even earlier than that. Um, but in the, by 1940 and 41, uh, there was a scrap paper drive. The war was on and we were all, the kids were all saving uh, their tin cans and paper for the paper drives. And I came across uh, B. Max Mel, uh, one of his little books. And um, just thought that was grand because it had a lot of pictures and a lot of information about coins in it. That was a big impulse. Um, and that together with my, uh, my background, so to speak, with Little Orphan Annie, I, I, was, I was sitting on top of the world because I, I knew about coins. <laughs> I, I wanted to cover one other, other thing here. Now, uh, you met your wife, Bert, uh, as children. And uh, yeah. apparently one of the things you two did uh, in high school together was uh, look through coins. Well, uh, in, in a sense, yes. Um, in 1946, um, Bert and I were well acquainted. We, we worked together in a grocery store at that time. It was pretty easy for kids to, to find work because the older people had all gone off to war. And um, so um, we, we were, we were um, well acquainted and chummed around as kids did in high school. And um, she knew that I collected coins. I knew that she liked cheese and I was uh, ahead of the, the uh, dairy department in this grocery store where we both worked. So I would always treat her to some cheese every time she walked past the counter. And, um, and so one day she treated me. She happened to be going down to Boston for some reason and, um, and found a, a coin book there. And it happened to be the first edition of the Red Book, uh, which she bought and brought home as a present for me. Um, so that was the uh, beginning of my real serious uh, interest in uh, the Red Book and numismatics and her. <laughs> and, <laughs> and a few years later, uh, we were married and uh, that began another adventure. So, uh, so you got a hold of the first edition of a red book, and at some point within the first few years of that book, uh, you began sensing that uh, well, there was stuff that maybe wasn't right in that book, or maybe needed updating. Um, mm -hmm. Where did that come from? How did you get into that? Well, that was true. I was reading everything that I could at that time, uh, which was very little, precious little material was being published, but the great thing was uh, the Numismatic Scrapbook Magazine. I could find a lot of information there. And uh, I was keeping track of things and, um, and recording whatever I could in my Red Book. That was my, uh, uh, my place for uh, recording all the information that I had. I would check off the coins that I knew people had. Uh, I would... Um, I would um, stuff clippings into this book. I still have that original first edition of the Red Book and it's still stuffed full of all this information and wow. it's still on my bookshelf. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, that, and that was, uh, it was a good, good learning experience for me and a good way to, to record information. And, uh, Sorry, go ahead. Well, at, at uh, some point then, 
after having done all of this study and all of this annotation, uh, you made so bold as to approach Richard S. Yeoman <laughs> and uh, tell him, uh, yeah. quite frankly, that uh, there were some errors in, uh, in his book. And of course, by now, Yeoman is a is a an icon in the field. Uh, where did you find the courage to do that? Well, um, I don't think we had many icons back then, and um, Yeoman is a very modest and quiet person, and so um, I was not intimidated by him at all. In fact, uh, we were quite friendly. We, we met at coin shows and we chatted and talked as everyone did back then. Um, coin, coin conventions were um, what they were supposed to be back then. People got together and talked about coins and, and, and enjoyed each other and learned from each other. And so um, idle conversation with Yeoman was, was nothing spectacular at that time everybody knew everybody in the olden days and um, I mentioned to him or I, maybe I just asked him some questions about you know where did you find this information or this doesn't seem to be quite right and uh, he was he was taken by that he, he thought that was pretty special and uh, because everybody shared information quite openly um, we had nice conversations about such things and and he was uh, um, of, of a kind of a person who would who would explore. He he knew that he was new to the game, and um, he um, had many friends that were feeding him information, and I became one of those. So he asked me um, if I wouldn't write this material up and send it to him, which I did, and. Um, a little later, he, well, eventually he asked me a couple of times, a couple of years, he said, why, hey, why don't you go through the whole book and tell me all these different things that you question and, and we'll see how that works. And um, it worked quite well. It worked well, well enough so he said, you know, if you do that, um, I'm going to pay you some money for, for doing this kind of editorial work for me. And um, that was when I had my conversation with wife, Bert. And I said, um, I suppose I should charge him like a hundred dollars for this. And uh, she said, no, <laughs> no, he's never going to pay you a hundred dollars. That, that was a whole week's pay back then. And uh, so um, I, I said, nope, uh, if I don't charge enough money, he won't have appreciate it. And if I... <laughs> And uh, if I do charge too much, he probably won't pay me, but I'm going to charge him $100, which he was happy to pay. <laughs> and, and then after that, he asked if I wouldn't do it every year. And uh, after two years, um, he said, hey, why don't you come to work for me? Which I did. Now, uh, before we get too deep into the Red Book, I want to hit on a couple other things. Um, you had started pretty early on doing coin photography and uh, apparently built a very substantial uh, coin photograph collection, which was unusual at that time. Uh, I guess it was unusual. And my motivation was I could not afford coins. I couldn't afford uh, to collect coins the way a lot of people did. And, and I was, had a burning interest in them. So I reasoned if I had pictures of them, that would be you know just as, as, as fine because I wanted to study them. And uh, I explored the field and I found that um, in the field of dentistry, um, they had made some kind of, kind of uh, homemade cameras that the dentist could use for photographing their, their um, patients and I, I guess recording their teeth and things like that. It was macro photography or close up photography. And um, so I tried to uh, imitate that. It simply meant adding some supplemental lenses to a camera and adjusting the lights. The lighting was the, was the major uh, hurdle. 
Uh, but I experimented and, and um, until I got it the way I wanted it, that I could take pictures and, um, and made something small enough that I could take it with me to museums, to uh, conferences, to collections, to uh, wherever I could find groups of coins. And uh, I guess I made a pest of myself at some of the <laughs> early uh, coin conventions because I'd go from dealer to dealer and if they had something that looked interesting, I'd uh, sit there and ph photograph it right at their table. Wow. Uh, but, but people were so friendly and, and um, accommodating back in those days that uh, that's the way things went. And uh, does the 10% uh, early photograph collection still exist? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, most of it in, uh, in 35 millimeter negatives wow. uh, or prints. Wow. Uh, but um, since then I've gone on uh, to be more sophisticated and, um, and use uh, every means I can to, of accumulating photographs. I still, still accumulate photographs. I have nearly uh, complete um, dye varieties of uh, all United States coins. Wow. Plus, plus other things, yeah. All right. Um, another thing people may not know about you uh, from your early career is that uh, you were handling some pretty big coins. Uh, you, uh, in the 1950s, offered to Eric Newman a, a Burton Spence, a New England shilling, uh, unlisted uh, Massachusetts silver. Uh, what was the extent of your dealing activities? Um, quite limited, actually. Uh, but um, because I knew where some coins were, uh, you know, who had what, because I had photographed them. And um, because I had a kind of a reputation, a good reputation for, um, um, for making deals, so to speak, I, I tried to bring two people together, somebody that had something they wanted. And, uh, you know, I was bold enough to um, tell... Um, Louis Eliasberg, that uh, he was missing a couple of pieces in his collection that he didn't know about. <laughs> and I knew where they were. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and the same with Eric Newman. Uh, but I had a much closer relationship with Eric Newman, as, as you know. And um, those pieces that you mentioned um, were a part of something that was known, and you might be known to you as the uh, Anderson Dupont collection. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, of, of large cents and other and I, everything. It had fantastic coins in there. I knew where it came. There, there is, by the way, no such person as Anderson Dupont. That was, that was a made up, made up name. Um, but I knew knew both of them quite well, and um, and I knew where customers were and that they didn't. So uh, they treated me quite well and uh, let me shop things like that around. And uh, that's how I happened to offer those to Eric. Um, the pine tree shilling, uh, one of the pine tree shillings that was in there, um, I ended up purchasing for myself and eventually sold it to the Norwebs through uh, Richard Picker. But that was kind of the network that I, that I worked at that time. Sure. Well, it I wasn't a big wasn't a big deal. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do this as a, as a livelihood. It uh -huh. just happened. I, uh, I have to ask, Ken, uh, Mr. Eliasberg uh, thought his collection was complete uh, when you told him that he was missing a couple. Uh, what was his reaction? <laughs> well, actually, I always had to work through his secretary. Um, and um, well, um, yeah, they, they just, they considered these things, but uh, in, in thinking, I never sold anything to him. Um, he just said, nah, I don't need that really. I don't, I don't think I want that. He, he was selective. He didn't buy everything. And um, I mean, he didn't just throw his money around <laughs> the way some people seem to do today. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they were always cordial, nice people. Yeah, and I enjoyed working with uh, people like the Norwebs and uh, and especially Eric Newman, of course, he was my very great friend. All right, uh, so getting back to uh, Whitman. Um, so it's uh, 
the mid 1950s, you got three young kids and you get an offer to go work on the Red Book full time. Uh, what, what was your family's reaction to this? You, you had, you know, steady work in the printing business and uh, mm -hmm. sort of pulled up stakes and said, we're going to go do the Red Book full time. Yep. Well, um, just everyone accepted it. Uh, it seemed like a, a, the right thing to do. Um, and I guess you know what New England weather is like. Uh, <laughs> sometimes that prompts people to move, move. And uh, as much as I love New England, and still do love it, uh, <laughs> it's, it's um, yeah. And um, and it was a it was a it would have been a nice salary increase for me, and and doing exactly what I like to do and wanted to do. So there was no resistance, um, no great resistance. Um, we just did it and, uh, and kind of made it a, a new adventure. All right, so, uh, so you got going on the Red Book and uh, the Red Book kind of runs on a, on, a, on a calendar. So there's a little schedule and regularity to it. Um, can you talk about how that came into being? Well, uh, yes, um, th there was actually a re good reason for that. Um, Yeoman was a, was a very good uh, salesman and, uh, and had a marvelous knowledge of, uh, of, of the, uh, what he was doing and, and how he could market things. And um, it turns out that uh, in the middle of summer, was a, a, traditionally a slump in the coin market. There wasn't much going on. People would be going on vacation or um, too busy to uh, play with their coins or whatever. And he reasoned that um, if he brought out the Red Book in the midst of that, it might uh, um, increase interest in coins at that time during this lull. And, and he thought that, and he was right. I don't, you know, I might have, I, I might have made a different decision about it. Stay away from the lull, but no, nope, he wanted to bull right into it, and uh, and he was right, and and so right that uh, as you know today, that's like the higher end of the market where the national conventions are and where everything goes on. But that was why he chose um, the middle of summer uh, to release the the. Um, new editions of each each of those books, the red book and the blue, and a little later, the blue book. So, and then in, in terms of uh, the editorial content in the red book, um, what, what was the dynamic between uh, you and Yeoman? Did he sort of just turn over parts of it to you and say, run with it, or how did that work? Um, he was uh, always, um, agreeable to listen to any, anything that uh, I would mention. And, um, and, and very much always would follow that advice. Um, he, we had a good partnership uh, because he was, he was a uh, superb uh, salesman and uh, planner. And, um, and, uh, and he knew that I could handle the numismatic end of things. Uh, Yeoman never, presented himself as a numismatist. And, and as much as he knew about numismatics, um, he, he really relied on, on others whom, whom he felt knew more, more than he. Um, I, I remember one time where someone asked him a question. Um, a, I guess he was giving a talk or something like that. And someone asked him kind of a sophisticated numismatic question. And his answer was, uh, I don't know that. He said, that's why I wrote the book so I could look it up. <laughs> <laughs> a great answer. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that was him. A question, Ken, about um, the, the decisions uh, that went into delisting uh, certain coins. Uh, for example, the Good Samaritan shilling uh, was was in uh, early editions of the Red Book, 
And uh, after Eric Newman's 1958 uh, numismatic notes and monographs on the subject, uh, it had to be delisted. Uh, how did you handle those kinds of things? Well, something that was uh, so obvious and so carefully, skillfully um, demoted by, by uh, Eric Newman, um, that, that was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, we knew, and everybody seemed to know at that time, that, yeah, it was time to go. There was no problem. On the other hand, uh, we really got um, wrongly influenced by John Ford and some of the things that he uh, uh, prompted us to list at one time in the Red Book. Um, and those things were kind of accepted by everybody at the moment. And uh, it took a lot of, uh, lot of finessing and a lot of uh, thinking to simply yank those out. But, but those were proven items, you know, proven to be wrong. Um, so uh, there was very little feedback uh, or, or uh, problems with that. There are other things that sometimes get listed. For instance, uh, things that were taken to be overdates or, um, or Bugs Bunny half dollars or, or things that, you know, should, just shouldn't be in there. And um, sometimes it's a little harder to, to demote those and take them out. We have to be very careful and do surveys and um, get many opinions before we pull the plug on some of those things. Now, by the 1960s, I think the, the Red Book was uh, circulating somewhere on the order of a million copies a year, uh, just one of the most popular books in the country. Um, at what point did you get a sense that what you put into this book had significant power to influence the market. People would eagerly wait for the Red Book to come out and reprice their inventory. And if a variety wasn't listed in the Red Book, maybe it wasn't worth collecting. Uh, the Red Book had and, and still has uh, a significant uh, ability to influence the market. Uh, I, when did you get a sense that that really was the case and uh, you needed to be very careful about what you were doing? Well, I think we had um, we had certain policies that were established by Yeoman, and and we've always uh, maintained the thought that we were reporting on the market and not leading the market. We've always felt that way and uh, and tried to be that way. That we were reporting and trying to be as accurate as possible about reporting the market, not leading it, and um, and that was the case back then, and I, and I hope it always continues to be that way uh, because that's what is intended. Um, yes, sometimes when a coin is listed, like, uh, well, let's say for instance, the 1955 double die cent, um, we went through a great process to list that. That was one of the first things that uh, I recall. We did surveys and, and um, gave it very careful thought before listing it. In fact, Yeoman really didn't think it belonged there. didn't want to list it. Oh. And, I, and I kind of convinced him after a lot of surveying and a lot of, a lot of um, thought, and we got that in. Uh, yes, sometimes, um, uh, well, I can't tell you how many times a year uh, we get leaned upon to list something sure. and have to go through the process of of deciding whether or not it's worthwhile listing. Um, I, I, I've let you in on a secret. My, my secret answer to these people, they'll grab, there. me at a, There's nobody else they'll, here. They'll, they'll grab me at a, at a convention and say, you, you've got to list this. Well, I happen to know he's been buying those and stockpiling them, you know, and I'm not going to give him the time of day. So I will say, I'm not going to remember that. I, people ask me so many things, I'll just forget it. Write it down, say on the back of a hundred dollar bill, and and I will I won't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll look at it and give it some consideration, <laughs> and, and, it, and they generally get a chuckle out of that, and 
and go on their way because they know what's going on. <laughs> and they know I know what's going on. <laughs> oh, it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, the Red Book has been published by Whitman uh, all these years, but Whitman has been many different companies through the years. Uh, the company that was in Racine, uh, the company that uh, was briefly elsewhere, and then the company that uh, the Andersons uh, own. Um, yes. And you stayed uh, through all of those changes. And, yes. uh, and uh, were there times when it was uh, kind of a difficult slog <laughs> through some of those changes in ownership to keep it going? Yes. Yes, um, and I even decided to move on for a while, but um, but I continued on as a freelance um, editor, and um, in fact, even until today, I'm I'm still involved, not heavily, but involved. Uh, I, and I've managed to stay involved throughout the whole thing. I'm I'm kind of like uh, the the. Um, um, historical background for, for every every question that comes along. How did we do this? Why, why did we do this? And, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy and proud to uh, be a part of the of the uh, the Red Book that long. I guess for over golly, for over about 60 years now I've been uh, a part of the Red Book and, and uh, mostly a key part. Now, when the Red Book started, uh, there was another uh, price guide out there. Uh, Wade Raymond had been uh, issuing his catalog since 1934, every couple of years or so. Yes. Um, what made the Red Book so much more successful than uh, the Wade Raymond catalog? Well, uh, I guess I got to let you in on another secret. My my ambition at that time in 19, late 1950s, my ambition, uh, because I was becoming kind of well-known and, and kind of um, um, uh, kind of uh, <laughs> sophisticated, more sophisticated numismatist. My ambition was to be uh, editor of uh, White Raymond's standard catalog. It was, it was uh, the leading one. It was very so much more um, sophisticated than the Red Book at that moment in history. Um, but um, it didn't work out. In fact, in the last, that 18th edition of the standard catalog, um, John Ford took it over and, and took over the editorship. And um, so I, uh, at the same time, had this opportunity with Yeoman and I said, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna, uh, we'll, we'll just see how this plays out. Uh, I think that we eventually, like a year later, a year or two years later, uh, the standard catalog ceased to exist and um, because we really did beat them up price-wise. Uh, the Red Book was only about half the price of the standard catalog. And um, we made sure that it contained more information and more accurate information. Um, the standard catalog was beginning to be controlled by the dealers who were pricing it. Um, we always tried to maintain that we were reporting on the market and not trying to lead the market and not trying to be overly influenced by um, market makers. So I, I think that was the turning point. I think that's what happened. And um, the, way I, the way I saw it. Now, you can, uh, one of the things people may not know about you is that uh, your first jobs really were in printing and uh, you so that you knew the printing business from the ground up you knew photography from the ground up um, and 
did that influence the way the Red Book developed under your leadership? Uh, because you knew those fields and you, you knew how to package a product as well as to edit the, the product? Well, yes, I, I think that's so, and I hope that's so. Um, I'm sure it all helped. All of those little, little extras um, go into the mix and, and uh, it's helped me along the way. Uh, but I never stopped uh, learning more about printing. Um, uh, Western Printing um, had, um, it was a very fine company and uh, they had training courses for, for people there, for all of their employees. And, uh, and I took courses in graphic arts and, and all of the related things that, uh, in business practices. I went to a business college. And um, so I, I just tried to combine all of those uh, uh, talents, you might say, uh, to make uh, the most of my numismatic career. All right, so you were uh, with Whitman in uh, Racine, Wisconsin until about 1980. And uh, then you were with uh, Kagan's for a couple of years. Uh, what led to you uh, leaving Whitman and uh, going into the retail side of the coin business? Well, um, I guess you call it greed. At that, <laughs> at that time, at that particular moment, um, I was teaching courses um, at the uh, summer seminars in the early 1970s and um, noticing that uh, lots of people were taking courses there, taking my courses even, and uh, becoming very successful coin dealers and making tons and tons of money. The market was uh, pretty, pretty strong um, in, in the uh, mid-70s. And so I thought, cheapers, maybe I ought to become a coin dealer. Uh, I think I've got the skills for it. And, uh, and I had a couple of good offers. Um, I had been turning down offers by uh, Bowers and Ruddy for a while. That was, that was certainly a mistake. Uh, <laughs> they've done very, very well. If you remember Bowers and Ruddy, that was one of the early incarnations. Um, but, um, but I had a nice offer from the Kagans and uh, it just seemed uh, kind of, it might be to my advantage to become a coin dealer. And, and so I did. I, I worked with the Kagans for about a year and a half, maybe close to two years. And uh, I found that I really didn't like it. it. It didn't suit my temperament very well. And, um, and then uh, Donald Kagan uh, decided to open a branch office in uh, San Francisco area and uh, asked me to join him there. And, uh, I th and at the same time, I had an offer from Ed uh, Rochette to become a director of uh, the ANEX operation in Colorado. And um, after a lot of deliberation, I, I chose to go to work for the ANA and uh, been, been very happy with that decision. And because it really didn't, wasn't suited to my temperament to be a, a coin dealers live a hard life. I found that out. So they travel all the time, and um, and you have to have that 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 uh, what they call killer instinct. I guess you know, It'd be very very forceful. I, it's probably not my my particular mode. So um, eventually, I. Throughout all of this, I decided to go on my own as a consultant and um, a freelance writer, uh, consultant, and whatever I am today. All right. Uh, so let's uh, talk about your time at the ANA a little bit. Um, everyone's favorite subject, uh, grading. Uh, <laughs> before we launch in, why don't you just sort of uh, tell us how people approached grading in the 1940s and 50s? Oh, we did it on our own, <laughs> the way they do today. <laughs> you make it up as you go along. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and that wasn't a good thing to do, but, um, uh, but everybody learned grading 
the best that they could. And believe it or not, most people at that time and, and even ever since, most people learn about grading through the Red Book. There's, there's a brief introduction to grading in the beginning of the Red Book. Um, and and uh, amazingly, it is, it is brief and it is so darn accurate that I wish everybody would just continue to use that today. Oh. But now um, you have to have, um, you have to mix with that <laughs> early issues, first day of issue, uh, stars and stripes and whatever they put on their holders today. <laughs> um, it's very, very confusing. And I don't think it's helped uh, people to, to uh, appreciate grading the way it should be. Um, but grading is not a, not a simple task. Everybody has to really learn to do it on their own and on their own terms, I think. Um, the, um, uh, I, I learned grading from the ground up. I, I worked with Dr. William Sheldon on, on his book, you know, and that, and that led a lot to the modern day grading. Um, I photographed his collection, his entire collection, so that I could learn how he was grading coins and why he was grading them that way. And um, so um, we, we found um, at the time that uh, grading got out of hand, I think in the, in the 70s, that there were, there were very confusing terms being used. Um, Godzilla was my favorite one. Uh, That's good. I'm going to use that. Yeah, and sex, sexy was another one. And uh, those, and they were nonsense terms that were being used. And um, so we, uh, Yeoman and I, and, and many others, of course, but we thought we'd, we'd try to have a campaign going so that we could, we could um, be, get a better handle on grading. And um, and the ANA seemed to want to be party of that. And um, so um, I, think, I think it was in the early 70s when um, several dealers convinced that there should be a meeting of the minds and ANA should probably lead the way to have grading standards. And uh, I was a party to that. Um, I worked closely with Abe Kosoff and um, Harvey Stack and, uh, and several of the other dealers, but we surveyed as much as we could in the entire um, coin industry, got all the opinions we could. And uh, then we of course sat down and said, okay, who's gonna write this? <laughs> who's gonna publish it? And I wanted a piece of the action. And uh, so I jumped right in and I said, okay, get, get your act together um, and I will write it in the best terms that I can. And um, we'll illustrate it the best way we can. And, um, and I wanted a publishing contract, of course. And, and that was the way it got started. It's, it's changed a lot since then, but we've tried to uh, keep up with the times and um, I hope it doesn't get out of hand again. It does seem to be headed in that direction. I have some concerns about that you now. That uh, we may have to go through this whole process all over again. I, I don't know. Uh, but I think that um, to protect the public and to encourage collectors to have confidence in the hobby, uh, we're going to have to have um, some strict rules about grading. Could you uh, tell us a, a little bit about uh, your time running uh, ANAX? Because that was a, a pivotal point in the, the history of the hobby when people began to send in their coins to be certified, uh, photographed. Uh, and, and, uh, that added, of course, value to them. Um, could you just give us a little recollection of... Uh, what that was like and uh, how it changed the hobby? Well, it was not fun, I'll tell you that. Um, it was a very serious undertaking. I don't think it was um, 
the ANA's purview to do that. I don't think they ever should have uh, started doing it on their own, uh, but they did. They jumped in I, and probably saved the hobby, uh, which was their intention. Um, but they weren't up to the task. They had to hire too many people to, to get into the fray. Um, I tried to um, be as much of a party to that. I was in the director at the time. And um, I had some people who we trained and, uh, and they've gone on to other company, run other companies now. And, and uh, you know, I think we did some good, but uh, there was always a resistance by the board of governors and by uh, legal counsel, uh, George Hattie at the time, uh, who always maintained that uh, this grading and um, authenticating, remember we started off to be an authenticating bureau, not a grading bureau. Um, they felt that that was a, a, a sort of a, um, did not fit their ANA's mode as being a non-for-profit uh, corporation. And um, they were always afraid of that, afraid that, uh, of some backlash. And they did indeed get <clears throat> lots of criticism. And so it was a board um, vote, by board vote, they uh, sold, sold that operation and, and moved on to other things. Um, it was not, <clears throat> it was profitable, but they, uh, but not as profitable as, uh, as it should have been. And uh, I, I think in retrospect, it probably was the best decision to, uh, to not continue on with it. But, but it was a very difficult, um, program throughout the entire thing. All right, and I know uh, one of the experts uh, ANA used at the time was Eric Newman, and if you look in his correspondence, you see these multi-page write-ups on single coins, and uh, to do that at any scale, very difficult, very difficult. Uh, yes, he was good at that, um, and several, several other people were. And um, but but the person that uh, that I admired so much at that time was um, Richard Picker, a coin dealer, and a good good friend of mine at the time. But Richard Picker had his own grading way. He people he ran he had a table at all the major conventions, and someone will say, "Well, now what grade is that?" And he would say uh, about four hundred dollars, <laughs> and that was his grade. And he wouldn't go beyond that. <laughs> All right, uh, we could go many hours here, but we've got a lot of questions. I want to get them in, so let's jump oh, in. Um, okay. When did you first become interested in colonial coins, and uh, what was the fascination of colonial coins for you? Uh, being a, a true Yankee and an old New Englander, um, I, w I was apt to find colonial coins in, the, in these little family collections. Flam everybody had a little cookie jar or something with co old coins in it. And, and it was not uncommon to come across uh, uh, some Connecticut coppers or, mm. or something like that. And, uh, and I just found them fascinating. And I thought it was part of my heritage. And, um, and I took it from there. Um, I, I um, <laughs> was very fortunate in finding some some nice colonials uh, in that way, and I knew they were genuine because I knew where they came from. They had been sitting in an old house for a long time. All right, uh, another uh, questioner asks: uh, Can you give a couple examples of the John Ford material that was uh, delisted from the Red Book? I don't want to go back to that. I don't I, want to ever think of. I don't want to think about those again. Um, <laughs> they they uh, they came up for auction in a Bowers auction many years ago, and were very carefully uh, cataloged there. Um, that was a sad sad um, part of American numismatic history, and I yeah. I. I um, don't want to be, I don't want to get into it. Yeah. 
the, these were specific uh, Western territorial pieces. And uh, if you look at a run of uh, guidebooks from uh, the 50s and 60s, uh, you'll discover pretty clearly which ones were removed. Um, next uh, question, uh, a book like the Red Book cannot be produced without a few errors. Is there any error that's uh, particularly memorable that you wish to admit to? <laughs> <laughs> Well, at one time we had a, a 198 Indian, uh, 198 SVDB scent listed. Um, we uh, had a whole page missing at one time and, uh, and a du duplicate of some other page inserted in there by mistake. Um, I, I suppose there were errors in just about every book ever printed, <laughs> and uh, including the red books. Um, uh, the way you find them is, is simple. Um, I take the first book off the press and I crack it open. And there, <laughs> right on that page, <laughs> is a stupid <laughs> error. I don't know how it got there. <laughs> And I have to decide, are we going to, are we going to no, just let it go. Nobody else is going to see it. And, and Yeoman would, uh, would tolerate that. Yeoman would say, eh, of course it's going to happen. And, um, and, and the readers will be your best editors. And I never forgot that. And he was absolutely right. People would write in with him. Do you know that you made a mistake in the mintage figure on such and such? And, um, and sure enough, we'd be off by, I don't know, one number or something. <laughs> but, but, but readers are nitpickers and it's wonderful. It's wonderful. They've been such a tremendous help. All right, well, that goes uh, right into our next question, which is, uh, is there a formal procedure for submitting suggested edits to the Red Book? Um, Yes, you, you write into the publisher and, um, and, and make your statement. And, and, um, and if we um, think that there's something ought to be changed or something added or deleted, it goes before a panel uh, of illustrious, illustrious people like uh, Bill Fieva, uh, one of our choicest um, consultants and um, and, and a number of people who are skillful and experts in various uh, areas. Uh, and um, so we actually have panel discussions and correspondence before any big changes are made. All right, and I would also add, uh, you can also talk to Dennis Tucker at Whitman. He's at most of the major shows. And you can yeah, that, that's who the mail would be channeled yeah. through him. Yeah. All right, uh, next question. Uh, I'm enjoying seeing your ancient coinage library on your shelves behind you. Uh, do you have a favorite ancient coin? Do I have a favorite ancient coin? Oh my goodness. Um, I suppose like, like just about everyone else, the decadrams of Syracuse are, are beautiful and, um, and I do admire them greatly and that I guess would be my favorite. I'll uh, throw a plug for Milestone Coins, a wonderful book Ken has written that, yes. about the coins that have literally changed history. Uh, that would be a bunch of favorites. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 next question, uh, reader asks, uh, one of the hats you wore at Whitman was editor of the Whitman Numismatic Journal. Uh, what led to the decision to uh, cease publication? Uh, it was at the end of 1968, I believe. Uh, to, to cease publication, yeah. was that what you said? Well, uh, it was a change in uh, management at Whitman. Um, they had changed direction and certain things. And, um, and it was simply a management decision. Uh, it wasn't, uh, we had some serious competition from other publishers, uh, you know, uh, Coin World and Numismatic News, and our circulation wasn't very great. And um, so it was, it was just a corporate decision. I, I enjoyed it. It was a great publication, actually. A lot of fun working on that. All right. Uh, here's a good question. Uh, 
besides the red book, what are the three numismatic books you could not live without? There's a book called uh, Coins of the World by R.A.G. Carlson uh, of the British Museum. I think it's, a, it's just a, uh, that's my favorite numismatic book of all times. And, uh, and I couldn't live without that. Well, that, that's figuratively speaking. <laughs> um, uh, of course, uh, uh, the Red Book is a great favorite of mine. And, um, and, and for, for a third, uh, does that have to be a numismatic book? Uh, <laughs> well, and he did ask about numismatic books, yes. Well, I asked <laughs> about numismatic books. I guess um, th there's a... There's a book on my shelf, I don't know if you can see it, uh, called, uh, Greek, called uh, Greek Coins. Yes. You see Greek Coins? Yep. Yeah. That, that's just by uh, Cray and Hammer. And um, that is just a, a, a grand book, a uh, beautiful book and beautifully done and uh, would be clearly my third, third choice. All right. Uh, another uh, viewer asks, uh, have you ever held in your hands uh, any of the famous rarities, 1804 dollar, 1913 nickel, uh, before they were slabbed, perhaps in your yes. early photography days? Yeah, oh, yes, indeed. All of those. Mm -hmm. All of them. I mean, all <laughs> of the known specimens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the... Um, one that Eliasberg owned uh, was in the plastic, though I couldn't, I couldn't get him to take it out of the plastic. All right. Uh, another question: uh, What words of wisdom or advice do you have for uh, starting collectors of ancient coins? What What are some of the challenges you had when you started, and how do you address those? Uh, um, I didn't quite hear you for for collecting ancient coins. Yes. Did you say? Yeah. A ancient right. coins. Well, the first thing is to read everything you can about them, and uh, and get a get a background that way, and and decide what it is you want to do. The the field of ancient coins is so vast that uh, almost no one can can attack all of it. You have to zero in on what you what you find of greatest interest, historical interest, or artistic interest, and. Uh, uh, first, learn all you can, and, and that's true of any area that you want to get into. Learn all you can first. <laughs> Buy the book before the coin, um, and um, and then make your choice. And do it your way. All right, Ken. Well, thank you so much. We are running over time. We could go a lot longer. Um, for those who uh, answered, asked questions, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everything. Um, Ken does attend the summer seminar at the a a in Colorado Springs every year. So if you have more questions for Ken, that would be an excellent place to ask them. Uh, the event's been canceled uh, for this year, but I'm confident it'll be back next year. And I'm confident Ken will be there walking around, attending all the classes, uh, keeping the instructors on their toes. So uh, Ken, uh, thank you very much for uh, appearing today. Thank you for having me and great success to the rest of your programs. Thanks so much.